Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield talking to international megastars. John Cleese, how are you? Mega, (laughs) megastar. You've made two mistakes already, can I say? Uh, Yes. One, you kept me waiting. That's a big mistake. But then, in repayment, you said I get an extra five minutes. Exactly. Because this guy here (laughs) organises the publicity tour. He's always cracking his whip and looking fierce. And I don't mind chattering away, because the nice thing is, I get a chance to talk to you. We have a bit of a gossip, and maybe I sell a few tickets. So what's wrong with that? Exactly. Is it nice that people still care? Yes, I think it is. And it's nice when people are kind of... Um, what, what I notice when I'm doing publicity in the provinces is that people are actually interested in the questions they're answering. In, sorry, people are actually interested in the questions that they're asking and they want to have a conversation. Not so with most of the English press. The press always have an agenda. An agenda. Before they go out, uh, the editor has said, see if you can find out about X. Or why don't we take the angle that so that they come to you with this agenda of a story that they want to write. So they're not really interviewing you. They're trying to get you to say things that will fit in to the story that they actually want to write. That doesn't seem to happen outside London. No, you see, all I want to know is, have you got neck curtains and do you watch Loose Women? Something like that. Uh, I certainly don't have net curtains because I don't have any curtains at all at the moment. I'm camping out at my new London flat. I have a sofa, uh, seven packing cases, uh, four grotted little chairs, a round table and a bed. And that's pretty much it. And my girlfriend has a power plate, you know, that Russian exercise. (laughs) If she's got that, she's happy. So no net curtains. Loose women, I've always been interested in loose women until recently. Well, I have an interest, you see, in why you've gone off loose women, whether it's because of your new relationship or because Jane McDonald's left. Oh, you're talking about the television show. I don't watch any television shows now. I thought you were talking about my genuine interest in loose women. Oh, the television show. Come on, John, keep up. Popular culture, this is. Yes, I know. Reality television, I understand. No, no, what I'm saying is that I don't watch much television now, apart from live sport. I was getting up at a ridiculous hours to watch the cricket. Uh, I'm not much interested in soccer anymore because I don't really care whether the North London mercenaries beat the West London mercenaries or the South London mercenaries. It doesn't matter to me. But I like a bit of live sport now and again. But I, I don't watch many comedy shows anymore because when you get to my age, you really have heard most of the jokes. You really have, and occasionally somebody comes along, like I remember Bill Hicks about 15 years ago, and you think, who the hell is this guy? He's brilliant. Or you suddenly discover Eddie Izzard, because I saw him fairly early on in his career and thought, oh, that guy's brilliant, or Ricky Gervais. But on the whole, you've seen most of it before, and I would rather read a book. I'm guilty about how few books I've read, and I, I tend to read. Are you glad that you were part of show business and still are when you were and are living off that now? The fact that people fell in love with you, respected you for what you do and are still interested in it, opposed to today where it's get famous, make as much money as you can, do big arenas, and then three months later we never hear from you again. I think that's right. And I think that uh, it's very hard for people to realise that the people who were working with me in my era, which is basically 60s and 70s, we didn't make much money and we didn't care. I mean, for a series of 40 towers, writing and performing, first series, I got £6,000. When I did 13 Monty Pythons, writing, filming, performing, I got £4,000 for 13 shows. Not a fortune. But we knew that we were working at the BBC, and it didn't pay well, but whenever people did shows at the BBC, they had a very good chance of making good shows, and if they switched to ITV and got more money, the show nearly always seemed to be less good. We didn't know why, but that seemed to be the rule. So now I think that's right. People can uh, can make money too quickly. And uh, I think it's very sad that money's become so important because uh, I was talking yesterday at great length about doing shows in arenas. I don't think that's what comedy's about. Great comedy's got a sort of intimacy about it. And I'm not that happy when I go over 1,500 people, unless it's a very special, wonderful, old-fashioned theatre where they seem to be able to make more like 1,800 fairly intimate. I wouldn't play an arena for any money in the world. I don't think you're giving people the experience that they used to want in my day but maybe they like it now maybe they like being out there with 10,000 other people listening to jokes and laughing and the whole thing goes at half the speed because the laughs take too long I don't know what the attraction is but some people must love it 
Talking of money, should I be feeling great that you're back on tour or really sad that you're back on tour and giving your money away to pay your ex? You should be thinking how splendid it is of my ex (laughs) to guarantee that I'm out on tour. (laughs) She should get all the credit for this because otherwise I'd be sitting at home having dinner with friends. I wouldn't be knocking myself out every evening. Go through the story for us. You had to pay us something like £14 billion, didn't you? Uh, Yes, that's right. Um, When we broke up in the therapist's office, because there had been some difficulties three years ago, it was finally decided by the judge that I... uh, Well, I have paid her $16 million, and I have to pay her a million dollars a year for the next five years, which, considering we had no children, she brought no assets or income to the relationship, she wasn't a very good organiser, uh, it's pretty hard to understand, except you, if you realize Californian law is called the passenger's charter. In other words, the one who doesn't work in the relationship, the passenger, is the one who can get a good deal. And if any of your listeners want to be rich, go to California, <laughs> marry someone, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, but marry uh, someone who is hardworking and makes a lot of money, then spend as fast as you can, establish as high a standard of living as you possibly can, and stop work <laughs> so you can claim later on that there's no way you can support yourself. Then, four years later, get a divorce and you're rich for life. I'm making notes here. This is brilliant. What I need to know is, was it worth it? Did she give you anything that you can hold on to now in terms of fun, in terms of some form of pleasure that was worth the investment that you're now making? Well, I have to say that I'm very old. (laughs) And (laughs) I'm sure there were some splendid moments that I will recall eventually. She was a very good, quick cook. In 20 minutes, she could cook up particularly vegetables extremely well. Jamie Oliver could do that for you, though, and he'd be far cheaper than 16 million. (laughs) Yes, I could take a bit of money off him. We're going to play a piece of music and we're going to come back with John Cleese. He's the big star. Back next with John Cleese. We're back on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield talking to John Cleese about his life and career. I don't want to keep going on about bitter old times because you're in a great place now. I could go on about them. (laughs) (laughs) What a great place you're in now. I was wondering, how do you pull someone who wouldn't even give me a second glance and I'm half your age? Well, I don't know. (laughs) She seems to like me, which seems a minor miracle. She even finds me mildly attractive, which I think maybe she's got bad eyesight or something. She told me you're delicious. She is very, very funny. She's the naughtiest person. She's completely mischievous. She spends her whole time winding me up. I mean, give you an example. (laughs) Two or three days ago, I was in London, coming back in the cab, and I rang um, my lovely assistant, Gary, who's my managing director and keeper and everything, and I said, uh, how's it going? And he said, um, have you spoken to Jenny? Did I said, not this morning. No, no. Um, she was gone in the morning uh, swimming when I left. And she said, uh, he, uh, he said, well, all her clothes are gone. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, well, you mean in the wardrobes? And he says, it's all gone. And I said, you can't be serious. And he said, and there's a note. And I said, what? And I, at this moment, my heart had stopped. I said, what? What's the note say? It says the cat's going to have to find another mother. And then there was a scream of laughter. She's sitting next to him. She set him up to do this. This is not a nice thing to do to a 71-year-old. No, I mean, it could end up with a coronary. She can't keep doing this to you. It's not funny anymore, well, is it? She won't stop, that's for sure. <laughs> and this kind of um, uh, ultimate playfulness, is, I find it enormously attractive because life's always fun. Mm. And that's what makes me think about those sessions when the guy was trying to make everything right with your ex. Did you just think it was quite funny? Because they do talk a load of nonsense in those sessions, don't they? No, it depends on whether the psychiatrist's any good or not. And there are good psychiatrists just as there are bad doctors. I don't think, honestly, you can you can generalise it. I do believe that a certain amount of insight helps enormously. And the guy that we saw actually sorted out certain communications. I used to misread one expression of Alice Fay for example, I, I thought that uh, she was disapproving of something when she was actually trying to understand it, and what, that helped a lot. But uh, one of the problems about uh, therapists is that sometimes they feel that they've sorted everything out themselves, um, and that they're only interested in sorting other people's problems out, and that can be a stumbling block. 
And of course, now you're in this great place where people are able to see you again. And thank you, by the way. I told you this last time when I came to Montreal, I flew all those 8,000 miles and it cost me 27,000 pounds in first class flights. And then you didn't turn up because you weren't well. Thank you, John. I was really sick. I had prostatitis and men will know what that is. And it's not nice at all. Could not pee. But never mind, what about my flight that I wasted? Well... You were the highlight of my trip. It was you or Jimmy Carr. I was sick. <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, I'm leaving that in. Uh, good luck in both of our careers. What do we get in the live show? Do we get the real you? Do we get some shtick? Do we well, get we comedy? Get the artificial me. I come on, playing the part of an Albanian peasant. No, uh, what, what you will see is you'll see a few <laughs> minutes of a very funny bit that somebody wrote uh, for me for Montreal. Seriously, for the Just For Nars thing, I was doing the big gala on the last night, and they wrote this very funny thing about what you could do with $20 million if you didn't have to give it to your ex-wife. So that's the first few minutes sort of saying, that's why I'm here in this dump, whichever the town is, but they love it when I call it a dump. And then I talk a little bit about uh, being born in Western Superman during the war, and then the Germans bombing Western, much to everyone's surprise, and people say, you know, bombs are expensive. Why are they wasting them on this place? And my father, who said that they're bombing Western to prove they do have a sense of humor. And a little bit of autobiographical stuff. And then it's straight into Cambridge. Cambridge, Footlights, West End, Go to America, go on, on Broadway. Then I'm in a musical with Tommy Steele where I'm not allowed to sing. Literally have to mime because I'm so terrible at singing. Then David Frost phone call. Hello, would you like to be in a new show I'm doing in the new year with people called Ronnie Barker, Ronnie Corbett? You won't have heard of them. Then I did that. Then I started working with Marty, who I met on the Frost Report because he was the uh, chief writer. Uh, Marty, Graham Chapman, Tim Brooke Taylor. We did a thing called The 48 Show. Got some funny stuff in it. And then what? Then writing for Peter Sellers. Very interesting stuff, I think, there. And then, of course, after that, it was Python. So that's the first half. And then the second half is a lot of stuff about offense, why people are offended, what kind of jokes you should do, what kind of jokes you shouldn't do, how I got a very black sense of humor from my mother. And that leads into talking about 40 Towers, which was really set in Western Supermare that we said talky. You know, it was really about living in Western. And then after that, um, we, we, we talk about Fish Called Wander, and then I look at my watch and I can go, very nice. Of all the people you mentioned there and all the things you described, the only thing I want to ask you is why have you still got a moustache? It's a bit strange. I always liked moustaches. Dad had one. And my favourite Somerset cricketer, Bertie Buse, <laughs> <laughs> who wasn't a terribly good cricketer, but he was a very nice man. He had a moustache and I grew one years and years ago. And everyone said, oh, you look better with a moustache. And I thought, well, anything that helps, you know. <laughs> to distract. Cheap. Well, it's <laughs> cheaper than plastic <laughs> surgery. Doesn't the current Mrs. Cleese find it tickles? Um, I, you know, I'll ask her. It's a good question. I'm so used to having it. It hadn't occurred to me to ask. She's never mentioned it. No, never mentioned it. Yeah. No. There you go. Well, I'll give you something to think about later. All right, we'll take another piece of music and we'll come back with our remaining moments. John Cleese is coming t- and he'll be doing the business with his alimony tour. We're back on The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield talking to John Cleese with our remaining moments. And thank you, by the way. There must be somebody far more interesting or important you could talk to right now. Yes. You could deny it. (laughs) (laughs) You have much more fun on radio than you usually do on television interviews. It's a much more relaxed medium. And I always thought if I ever did a talk show, I'd much rather do a talk show on radio than I would do a television talk show. So. I'm sure I can speak to the bosses if you want a gig here at BBC Radio Leeds. Would I have to come up to Leeds to record the shows? Yeah, you can do it anywhere now, can't you do it in your bedroom? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> well, anyway, radio is such a, a friendly, warm uh, medium, and the trouble is uh, I can't earn a living out of it. But the nearest Neither thing can I, it, by the way. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I noticed the suit. Um, what, I do, what, I, what I do discover though, is that what I like best now is doing voices for animation because it's just like radio. You walk into a small sound studio, they show you the storyboards of the scene you're about to do and then you do it just as though it's radio except you do lots of takes which is nice because it's very hard for them then to choose a bad one. 
Is it fun being you? Because wherever you go, people want a bit of you for different things. I mean, I think of Will and Grace, they wanted you for that. You added so much to it and gave a character that's actually quite difficult to do anything with a new life on the programme. And then, of course, your animation, you mentioned that. Everybody wants your voice. Um, and then we still want to repeat you on Faulty Chowers. By the way, they are still paying you for that because they're making the money, aren't they, at the repeat? Oh, yes. I mean, we got tiny money at the beginning, but uh, they have to renegotiate all the time. So don't worry, I get a very good slice. I'm worried about you. That's all I am. I'm concerned. Concerned. And when you watch yourself back, is that comfortable or do you try and avoid it? Um, often it's more curiosity. I mean, if it's something I've seen a million times and I won't bother somebody, I suddenly see uh, Basil Goose stepping with the Germans, I probably don't bother to watch it but uh, because I've seen it so many times. But if it is something I haven't seen before some, or f for some time, I'll watch it with a certain amount of interest. And sometimes I think that was really funny. Like last week, I went on YouTube and discovered there was a sketch there that I'd done with Rowan Atkinson in about 1982, three, for the Amnesty show. Hilarious. And I watched it twice. It was I was making myself laugh out. Out loud. Other times you switch on and there's a Python running and you watch a sketch and you think, not only was that not funny, I don't know how we ever thought it might be funny <laughs> if we got it right in the first place. So you just have all these different reactions, but you get so used to seeing yourself on television. I was actually working out two days ago in a gym and I glanced up and there was my AA ad. And I thought, oh yeah, and I went on working out and I thought, no, no, stop, watch it. You know, but you get so used to it after four. 40 years that it doesn't have any effect. Kendall told me recently that it's like watching your son on the telly, though, because he doesn't look you anymore, but you know it's you. It's kind of a part of you. Yeah, that's right. I've often thought <laughs> of the guy up there as sort of a first cousin of mine <laughs> who goes out to earn me the money. And of all the people you work with, I mean, you mentioned the Ronnies and the Rowan Atkinses. You've worked with the elite, the best, the, the most creative people in the, the medium of being funny. Who's impressed you the most? Oh, that's interesting. I thought that... Uh, Peter Sellers was the greatest comedy actor I ever saw. And he could just do your voice. Uh, he could listen to you for five minutes and do it. I mean, it was absolutely uncanny, but it was because the great impersonators often don't have a very strong personality of their own. So they don't have to get their own personality out of the way because there's not much there to start with. But I thought he was the, the greatest performer. Uh, writer, I would have said Peter Cook. I, I, I knew Peter very well, particularly latterly, poor, so sad about his dying, you know, because he was just getting his life back together. He had a bad period after his second marriage and his mother died, and I thought everything was coming together. Uh, he was a genius. He was the only guy I ever worked with I thought was a genius. And I remember Frank Muir saying, you could saw it off by the yard. I mean, if you wanted a three-minute sketch, it took Peter three minutes to write it. He was an absolute genius. So those are the two I'd pick up. Do you wonder why you, why you're sat here today, all these years later since you did the big stuff and people are still curious and you're still contemporary and people are still selling out across the country and coming to see you? Why you? Well, I, th I think that it was a very good time. I think from the 50s to the end of the 80s, we had the least bad television in, in the world. And I think we just had a lot, a, lot of, a lot of shows. Now, I don't understand the appeal of a lot of modern stuff. And I'm not particularly um, sort of cutting edge or anything. I'm just doing what I think is funny. And I think it would have been reasonably funny 30 years ago. But people still seem to like it. They don't mind the more old-fashioned kind of stuff because it was actually pretty bloody good. Did Eric Idle ever know what he was doing or was he just lucky? Just lucky. Very lucky, and particularly lucky to work with me. Mm, mm. Yes, and he adapted, as you know, the film that I wrote with the help of a couple of other Pythons and made a fortune out of a musical. <laughs> Which is coming back here to West Yorkshire in a couple of weeks, and it's selling out up and down the country. Are we ever going to see you in anything like that? Would you be tempted by a musical or something different? It's just possible that if I do the musical of Wanda which is some way down the road because we have to sort out the right situation with MGM or are still in a terrible mess. And then we have to find a director and then we have to find a composer. But my daughter, Camilla, and I have written the book. So we've got what I think is a very good plot, a very good story, which is quite different from the... And the ending's last 20 minutes is completely new. And I'm very proud of what we did. That would be fun. And if we had that on in the West End or had it on on Broadway and I was happy that it was working, then I would take over one of the roles, not 
Archie, but Archie 20 years on who's telling people about what happened as a narrator, in other words, who was Archie in the movie. I could do that for two or three months. But I have to be fairly careful about two things. I mean, one is uh, my energy is still very good, but as you get older, if you pull a muscle or something, it takes longer to heal. And the other thing is I still have a complete inability to sing, so there's no way I could do that. I mean, when they offered me Fagin about a year ago, I thought, don't they, don't they know how bad I am? <laughs> Isn't it a shame you could be filthy rich if you hadn't got married? This is true. This is true. It's very depressing. Hey, listen, I'm really angry. We've sat here for 20 minutes, and I haven't asked you one question. I'm so sorry. We haven't even started the interview. Can we do this again? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. John Cleese, thanks for coming on the programme. It was fun.